the other system which is intrinsically linked to the respiratory system is the cardiovascular system now if i i'll take a little bit of deviation from here if you want to define critical care or intensive care it is all about two things making the blood go round and round and making the air come in and out so these are the two core fundamental activities which an intensive care guy does or an intensive care does thus because the lungs and the heart are intrinsically linked to each other so if you look at the uh, the the patients um, uh, who are ventilated as the uh, right atrial pressure increases the central venous pressure the, the pressures vary during the inspiratory and expiratory phase of the ventilator cycle the fact which all of us have to remember is that mechanical ventilation is a reverse of spontaneous breathing so what happens during inspiration in spontaneous breathing actually does not happen the same way during inspiration of mechanical ventilation which is a positive pressure breath so there is huge fluctuation in the intravascular in the right atrial filling pressure during inspiration and expiration so when the intrathoracic pressures are high the right atrium collapses the venous return decreases and the cardiac output falls while a stable uh, uh, intravascularly adequately filled patient will tolerate it a patient who's got hypovolemia whose myocardial condition is not good may not tolerate this so initiation of ventilation could result in a compromise in the cardiac output of these patients so heart lung interaction so how much tidal volumes have been given to these patient and how what is the peep and the effect of all this is obviously seen on the cardiovascular system so if you look at the right atrial pressure and if if you look at this fall uh, as the positive pressure ventilation is increased as i said it is very intrinsically linked to the thoracic pressure so a rise in thoracic pressures will probably decrease the right atrial pressures and the forward flow would then get significantly compromised so if you compare and contrast spontaneous breathing versus mechanical ventilation breathing in spontaneous breathing the pleural pressure uh, is actually uh, during inspiration it's a negative pressure breathing so intravascular the intraventricular pressure becomes more negative relative to the systemic pressure so the afterload is actually on the highest side uh, during positive pressure pre ventilation there is an increased transpulmonary pressure and there is a direct effect on the right ventricular outflow and there is a compression of the pulmonary capillary so the pulmonary vascular resistance and afterload are also increased the fact you need to remember is that all this phenomena is actually happening in a patient who is hypoxemic and a hypoxemic patient the hypoxemia per se contributes to vasoconstriction this pulmonary vasoconstriction which is produced by hypoxemia perpetuates the dynamics of the right heart which are produced by the pressures that are generated by positive pressure ventilation you are actually playing around with the pressures in the thorax and the lung to get over this uh, problem of hypoxemia so the interplay between the pressures outside the heart versus the pressures it is facing upstream because of hypoxemic vasoconstriction will ultimately decide the cardiovascular response of a patient to mechanical ventilation another important fact you have to remember is uh, is something called as ventricular interdependence that comes from the fact that both the ventricles share a fixed space in the pericardium and the diastolic pressure that is the end diastolic volume of one ventricle influences the diastolic filling of the other ventricle if a ventricle is overfilled does not empty completely a part of its volume is left the other ventricles ability to fill during its diastolic phase gets compromised when the right ventricular volume rises because of its inability to empty because of higher pressures upstream in the pulmonary circulation the left ventricular filling falls so when the left ventricular end diastolic volume falls the left ventricular stroke volume falls and when the stroke volume falls you know that stroke volume uh, is an integral determinant of cardiac output the cardiac output would fall and the patient would develop hypotension
So if there is an increased right ventricular end diastolic volume, it means that the left ventricular end diastolic volume would decrease. So this is the important thing which you need to remember about the interventricular dependence and the heart-lung interactions. This is, this is an important concept which determines how well your patient is accepting your ventilatory strategies. And this picture will capture your uh, entire description of wh what is the relationship between the diameter and the filling pressures. So with positive pressure ventilation, PEEP and pulmonary vascular resistance, if the right ventricular filling uh, is uh, emptying is not complete, then the left ventricular filling gets uh, compromised. So this is a fact we need to remember and this interplay is very crucial for managing these patients. The other system which some is prone for dysfunction or complications during mechanical ventilation is the gastrointestinal system. Mechanical ventilation is an independent predictor of stress ulcers. The stress factor for a patient who is mechanically ventilated increases by 1.5 to 1.6 times for developing uh, stress ulcers. So there is a high risk of stress ulcers. So prophylaxis is routinely being prescribed for these patients, but that thought process is now under scrutiny. We will discuss this at a later stage. As the intrathoracic pressures are increased um, and the diaphragm gets pushed lower and lower because of your, uh, mani your manipulation of the airway pressures to deliver more and more oxygen, feed intolerance increases exponentially with increase in peak. So these patients have a higher chance of throwing up and if the and the higher chances of increased gastric gastric residual volumes so if they are intolerant of their feeds and because their requirement is much higher these patients who are on mechanical ventilation are at a higher risk of malnutrition if you look at the stress factor for calculating caloric requirements of a critically ill patient mechanical ventilation has a stress factor of 1.25 to 3 for 1.3 for these patients as far as the caloric requirement is concerned. Because of the effects of hypotension, gut dismotility because of illness, the inadequate gastric emptying, the increased gastric residual volumes, and the interplay between intrathoracic pressures and gastric filling, aspiration risk is very high in these patients even with the cuff inflated. Even if you have a very meticulous monitoring of the cuff pressures with a manometer, the endotracheal tube cuff will give you only 90% protection against aspiration. It doesn't give you 100% uh, protection. So certain hepatobiliary complications have also been reported in patients who are mechanically ventilated. Mechanical ventilation reduces the portal venous blood flow, while the hepatic arterial blood flow is not significantly altered by mechanical ventilation and your ventilatory settings. So there could be a hepatic venous congestion because of normal flow and inadequate drainage. So you could result, you could get a congested liver on ultrasound. You could get some transaminitis on patients who are mechanically ventilated. And this is potentiated by the hepatocellular injury, which is produced by hypoxemia. Because of all this, your drugs, which you are using for sedation, uh, or your antimicrobials or your antiarrhythmic drugs, the metabolism is significantly slowed down and their therapy drug levels are elevated in patients who have uh, mechanical ventilation related hepatopiliary dysfunction. Neurological complications also seem to happen in these patients and are often uh, they are unnoticed because for a good period of time, your focus is on the hypoxemia your, fo your focus is on delivering the mechanical ventilation uh, on the PEEP, on the tidal volumes. So you, you don't have the bandwidth or the scope or the time frame to assess the patient's neurological condition. A sick patient who is on uh, stiff ventilatory support, you can't uh, wean off the or you can't switch off the sedation and look at his neurological status. You can only do it when the situation gets better. But the important reasons why neurological complications happen in these patients is the fact that there is vasoconstriction, secondary to neural, uh, intracerebral vasoconstriction, secondary to hypercapnia. And there may be in decreased intracerebral blood volume, 
and therefore there could be changes in the auto regulatory changes in the cerebral blood flow and intracranial pressure when you increase the peep in patients who have ARDS um, who for hypoxemia the peep reduces the cerebral perfusion pressure by decreasing the venous return and increasing the intracranial pressure so there is a correlation between the PEEP and the intracranial pressure and 20 to 25 percent of it is transmitted to the central venous pressure in a compliant lung. But in ARDS, the lung is not very compliant. So the PEEP is transmitted into the intracranial compartment only if the PEEP exceeds the ICP. So if you accept that the normal ICP is between 15 to 18 or 15 to 20, you don't set the PEEP more than 20. If the PEEP exceeds more than the ICP, the PEEP gets transmitted to the intracranial compartment. An interesting thing or effect of mechanical ventilation on the neurological system is its effect on sleep. While we think that we are doing a good job by sedating the patient, by giving benzodiazepines, by giving propofol, by giving opioids, by giving dexmedetomidine, that's not actually true. If you look at all the patients who are well, who look well sedated on endotracheal tube on mechanical ventilatory support, mechanical ventilation reduces the stage four sleep significantly. You can see in this chart that the stage four sleep in a patient uh, is significantly short when they are on controlled mechanical ventilation, and it shortens the rapid eye movement sleep as well. And patients have very bad uh, memories of their period in the ICU when they were supposed to be actually deeply asleep and this when you switch off sedation and wake them up causes delirium so when there is delirium you go back to your benzodiazepines you go back to your antipsychotic medications and then this vicious cycle perpetuates itself and all these factors contribute to the onset of neuromuscular weakness together with the neuromuscular blockade which you have used in the initial day initial days of mechanical ventilation in the uh, amongst the other organ systems about which we have more knowledge at this point for systemic complications is the kidney the kidney suffers damage because of hypoxemia there is uh, uh, hypovolemia a relative hypovolemia and the effect of intrathoracic pressure on the left ventricular outflow we have already discussed if there is a uh, hypotension as a result of inappropriate or in a, of a failing heart which had to be ventilated there is a decrease in the GFR and along with the decrease in the GFR there is a hypoxemia which is the basic cause for initiation of mechanical ventilator support this hypoxemic ATN um, is actually triggered by a decreased GFR because of heart lung 4 heart lung interactions and a relative hypovolemia that is activating the renin angiotensin aldosterone axis.